tambourine man. 19 minutes past 8 o'clock. Good morning to you this morning. You're tuned to Radio Caroline on 199. On August 1965, while Mr. Tambourine Man was climbing up the charts, the birds landed in the UK for a British tour. Problems started as soon as they set foot in London. At the time, Future Stones member Ronnie Wood was playing in a band which was also called The Birds. The Birds had released a few singles without much success but they were a pretty popular band in the UK's club circuit. The arrival of a successful American band with the same name, even if it was spelt differently, was a huge blow to the British Birds. Their manager decided to start legal proceedings, obviously without much success. In an interview a few years ago, Roger McGuinn remembered. We didn't know anything about that. Ronnie Wood was in the group. When we got off the plane in London, a, a barrister, as they call lawyers over there, came up to us and handed us a writ, which is like a subpoena to appear in court. And we were sued for uh, usurping their name, which we had. But the judge threw it out because we had the number one hit. The success of Mr. Tambourine Man prompted the British press to hail the birds as the next big thing. Many articles were written about them and there were great expectations placed on the tour. The birds spoke to the press upon arrival. McGuinn said, the British groups are new and fresh, they have presented music in an original manner. The music itself is not new, it's a mixture of all types. America contributed a lot to popular music. Britain added something else and now we want to inject a little more. It's rather like a ball being passed across the Atlantic that grows all the time. David Crosby said, we like the English mod clothes. There are lots of groups in the States now with long hair but very few have anything to offer. There is one though which I think will be very big called The Loving Spoonful, they're really great. Crosby added, we want to go to Carnaby Street for clothes and we want to meet the Beatles and see the historic places in England. The birds appeared on some of Britain's most popular television shows like Ready Steady Go and Top of the Pops promoting their latest single. However, their live shows seemed to disappoint a lot of people. Just a week after the tour started, the letters sections of several British magazines were filled with letters by fans complaining about the Birds' stage act. A new Musical Express journalist wrote, I seem to be knee-deep in anti-Birds letters, here's a small selection. A fan called Margaret Whitfield from Tottenham, London, wrote, My friends and I went to see the Birds and thought they were terrible. The sound was awful, they didn't bother to introduce any of the songs, they tuned up on stage, and altogether they had no talent or personality. New Musical Express journalist Keith Oltham reported, Along with Sonny and Cher, I went to see the birds on stage at Finsbury Park Astoria last Saturday. Following on their number one hit Mr. Tambourine Man, the group arrived in this country with a publicity theme along the lines of America's answer to the Beatles. On Saturday's performance, it was a pretty pathetic reply. After tuning up for a full five minutes behind the curtain, they were treated to a traditional slow handclap by the impatient audience. Then their first two numbers were completely drowned by over-amplification. I have it on good authority from Cher that the first number was all I really want to do. But the vocals of that and the next number were inaudible. Stage presentation is non-existent and so is any communication with the audience. Although at one stage McGuinn did say hello. I caught Donovan's act as he was closing the first half and his pleasant soft voice was well received by the audience. We got backstage with Sonny and Cher and I tried to communicate with the birds. I spoke to David Crosby, who looks like Batman Jr. with dimples. Crosby said, I thought we were good tonight. We don't talk much to the audience because we like our music to speak for us. I wonder if people realize how tired we are. We had a month's tour of America before coming here and were knocked out. With that, David Crosby wrapped his green cape around himself and turned his back on me to talk to Donovan. McGuinn is a likable person. He wears his squared glasses permanently on the bridge of his nose and he peers at you over the top like an admonishing school teacher. He never raises his voice above a whisper. Gene Clark walks around in a mantle's hat saying, hi all. Chris Hillman seldom says anything and Mike the drummer, reads papers through a fringe combed over his nose. The bird's biggest fault is this cool couldn't care less attitude. The audience don't like it and neither do I. Just before they flew back to the States, Rave magazine interviewed the birds about the controversial tour. Rave's journalist Maureen O'Grady wrote, What went wrong with the birds' visit? At the Fairfield Hall in Croydon, the fans hurled warmth and adoration, but the birds didn't give much back. 
Also, the sound balance was not good. Let's face it, their sound is the most important thing about them. They are different and they must have good equipment. We have never used equipment like this before, McGuinn complained at Croydon. So they faced the first difficulty of the tour. Outside the stage door that night, a girl clung to David Crosby saying, I love you bird, but he just walked away disinterested. With each appearance, things grew cooler both sides of the footlights. The Joe Collins agency, who handled the birds over here, claimed that they did organize the birds. An agency spokesman told us, the birds had two road managers and cars always at their disposal. But how much can anyone organize artists who are after all free human beings? Apparently it is difficult, for the birds suffered a loss of £1,000 in penalties for playing late or short time. At one of their shows, they were fined for playing short time. Their excuse, we felt tired. At the 32 Club, Harlesden, they were one and a half hours late appearing on stage. Their excuse, McGuinn was having dinner with Paul McCartney. Drummer Mike Clark said, we didn't really go down as well as we expected. The mistake was probably that we only had one hit record at the time and we needed a string of hits before coming to Great Britain. Los Three o'clock in Los Angeles on a million dollar weekend with me, baby. The real Don Steele. All those groovy goalers for the reminiscing fun devils out there, huh? Tonight's our night back just party in the fun jungle. You better believe it. Dig. A couple of months before their British tour, the Birds had played with the Stones in the States. They were the Stones' opening act in a few dates from that tour and became quite friendly with them. After the massive success of Satisfaction in the summer of 65, the Stones went back to the States for a 35-date tour which commenced on the 29th of October and concluded on the 5th of December. A few shows from that tour also featured the Birds supporting the Stones. On the 24th of November, after a show at the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, Gene Clark wrote 8 miles high while hanging out with Brian Jones. In an interview from 1983, Gene Clark spoke about the writing of the song and Brian Jones' involvement. The actual song, Eight Miles High, um, was started writing. I actually wrote the song and then uh, presented the song to McGuinn and Crosby on tour. We were on a bus tour at the time, and we were listening to a lot of John Coltrane, a lot of Ravi Shankar, a lot of things like that, and mm -hmm. they f helped me finish the song. The melody and lyrics I wrote myself in a hotel room with Brian Jones in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So that's so you should have that's art credit on there somewhere. Well, I, I thought so at the time, you know, yeah. but of course he he didn't care. You know, I just came out of a conversation. Gene Clark also spoke about the song in this interview from the mid seventies. Started with a conversation with Brian Jones in in a hotel room when we were on the road with the Rolling Stones. We were eating dinner in the hotel room because we couldn't go out. There were like five hundred kids outside, and I started getting ideas from talking to Brian. And uh, we were actually talking about William Burroughs. Now, what that has to do with Eight Miles High, I don't know, you know, but he was a Burroughs fan, and so was I. Following the Los Angeles concert on the 5th of December, Brian Jones and Keith Richards attended the second Acid test party held by Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters. Acid had arrived. A few days later, on December 22nd, the Birds recorded an earlier version of Eight Miles High at RCA Studios in Los Angeles. However, Columbia Records refused to release this recording because it had not been produced at a Columbia-owned studio. The Birds were forced to record the song again at Columbia Studios in Hollywood on 24 January 1966. Roger McGuinn has since said he believes the original version of the song sounded more spontaneous than the better-known release. This opinion was echoed by David Crosby, who commented. The original version was a stunner, it was better, it was stronger, it had more flow to it, it was the way we wanted it to be. This original version of 8 Miles High was eventually released on the 1987 archival album Never Before and was also included as a bonus track on the album Fifth Dimension, when it was reissued in 1996.